Good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Gary Stowe. I'm president of the Solera Oak Valley Greens Association. And tonight, it's my privilege to host the five candidates competing to fill Mike Morrell's District 23 Senate seats. At this time, I would really like to introduce the vice president of the association, Elaine Morgan. Elaine is going to introduce the candidates and explain how the candidate forum will be conducted this evening. So Elaine, if you'll come over and take over. Thank you, Gary, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, as Gary said, we have uh, five candidates that are seeking election to fill Mike Morrell's Senate seat, uh, which is being vacated due to uh, term limits. The elected candidate will serve a four-year term representing Senate, State Senate District 23. District 23 covers a wide area that encompasses portions of Riverside, San Bernardino, and Los Angeles counties. It extends south just past Menifee, east uh, just past Cabazon, north of Big Bear, and west of Rancho Cucamonga, so it's a very large territory. The primary election will be held on March 3rd, and the general election will be held on November 3rd. So I'd like to introduce the candidates, and we'll go down alphabetically. So, Rosalicia, Rosalicia. close. It was pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> that works. Um, Acho, Achoa. Ochoa. Achoa. Achoa. Bo. Bo. There, got that one right. <laughs> I know, obviously my parents were not thinking political endeavors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you are a native Californian and the daughter of Mexican immigrants. Uh, you live currently in Yucaipa with her husband of 23 years, Greg Bo, and their three children. You have uh, always believed that home ownership signifies the American dream, and when you and your husband purchased your first home, you remembered your teary-eyed father proudly saying you've made it. A 16-year realtor and Woman of Distinction Award recipient, she's devoted herself to helping others achieve that dream. She's a graduate of San Bernardino High and UC Santa Barbara. She serves at, served as an ele elementary school teacher and also taught English language learners. Today, she serves on her local school board. Her experience has well prepared her to champion stronger schools, lower taxes, better infrastructure, and more affordable home prices. She believes that the high cost of living in our state is hurting people and taking away their dreams. She hopes to boost economic opportunity, preserve local control, and reverse the cycle of higher taxes and increased government intrusion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Chris Goodfellow. That one I've, I got that right out easy. <laughs> Chris is a small business owner, a former journalist for some of the country's most respected publications, and an active community volunteer in her hometown of Redlands. Her career as a journalist, technology professional, and entrepreneur has given her a deep understanding of local, state, and national issues and the ability to build agreement and collaboration. After graduating with a journalism degree from Northwestern University, Chris went on to work at the Chicago Tribune, Associated Press, National Geographic, and the New York Times. She made the leap to technology after being recruited by ESRI, the world's leading supplier of geographic information systems software, to work on its media team. From there, she became an entrepreneur, leading startup ventures for the National Association of Realtors and others. Chris supports smarter use of existing taxes rather than more taxes. She advocates using research to, de to determine if what we are spending taxpayer money on really works. For example, she says housing people is cheaper than providing the necessary services to people who have no homes. Also, research shows that the current prison system is very expensive, but is not working properly. 
One of her key goals is to help close the income gap between wage earners and the Inland Empire. She also advocates improvements in education to help better train the future workforce to adapt to advancing technology. Thank you. Welcome, Thank you. Chris. Thank you all for coming too. Okay. Abigail Medina. <clears throat> As the oldest daughter of working class immigrant parents and a working mother of five, Abigail Medina knows firsthand the, cons the concerns many parents and grandparents have about how the environment and our education system are affecting their children and grandchildren. She has championed environmental protection, educational improvement, equality and fair treatment for, in her hometown of San Bernardino and throughout the Inland Empire. She is currently president of the San Bernardino Unified School District Board and executive director of the Inland Region Equality Network. Under her leadership, graduation rates in San Bernardino now exceed state and county standards for the first time in more than 40 years. Abigail has also spearheaded efforts to increase parent engagement, to improve college readiness for all students, and to create school safe zones. As a volunteer community advocate, she has worked tirelessly to expand opportunities for at-risk youth and families from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. In 2016, Abigail ran for the California State Assembly 40th District against an incumbent and came in first in the primary. Although she finished less than 2,000 votes behind the incumbent in the runoff, she was praised for her grassroots campaign emphasizing environmental, social, and economic justice. Welcome, Abigail. Thank you. <clears throat> Christina Paracci, correct? Thank you. Christina was raised in the impoverished Social Republic of Romania. As a child, she faced significant health challenges as a result of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in bordering Russia. She immigrated to the United States at the age of 18. Christina married her fiance, Adrian, in 1992, and they moved to the Inland Empire. She earned a bachelor's degree from Cal State University San Bernardino and a master's degree in education from National University. She began her teaching career in 2004 at Colton Junior Unified School District and subsequently became president of the Association of Colton Educators. Her innovative in initiatives aimed at streamlining local education and government earned her the Distinguished Who We Honor Ours Award from the California Teachers Association. Christina was elected to the Redlands Unified School District Board of Trustees in 2016 and currently serves as its president. She is a member of the San Bernardino County Drug and Gang Task Force, the Redlands Cultural Arts Council, and the Colton Yukaipa Redlands Regional Occupational Program. <laughs> Supporting children and veterans is close to Christina's heart. She and her husband have sponsored six children through the World Vision Program, and she has worked in her community to provide aid and shelter for the homeless veterans. She is an advocate for common sense solutions that will lower cost of living, strengthen public safety, reduce homelessness, attract high wages, improve education, and protect the environmental environment while preserving constitutional liberties. Welcome, Christina. And Lloyd White. Lloyd grew up in Escondido. He graduated from UCLA in 1994 with a degree in economics and earned an MBA from the University of Redlands in 2004. Since 1997, Lloyd has been employed as a software developer at ESRI, the world's leading geographic information system software company. In 2014, Lloyd was elected to the Beaumont City Council and was re-elected in 2018. He has represented the citizens of Riverside County on the Riverside County's Transportation Commission, the Western Riverside Council of Governments, and the Eastern Riverside County Interoperable <laughs> Communications Authority, a regional joint public safety radio communications agency. 
He is also a member of the Western Riverside Law Enforcement Appreciation Committee. In 2015, Lloyd helped expose a $40 million scandal in Beaumont, which led to the arrest and felony guilty pleas of six top city officials. The city has so far secured $12 million in restitution. Since then, he and his colleagues have instituted a new property tax reform program to fix the city's troubled Melrose program. Among other things, this has resulted in savings of more than $4 million annually for nearly 90% of Beaumont's Melrose taxpayers. Also by raising $8 million in developer contributions to build the Pichero Route 60 interchange, Lloyd and his colleagues helped attract Amazon to build a beautiful fulfillment center, which will bring more than 800 new jobs. <coughs> Welcome, Lloyd. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to introduce Steve Melman, and he's going to go through the, um, what do you call it? The rules, the procedures. <laughs> so I'll let you take that over. Thank you, Elaine. Well, let's go over the ground rules for this evening. First, uh, working with Elaine is Sandy Bess from our administrative office. We're delighted to have her with us tonight. Okay, let me turn the uh, podium around because I'm going to be talking to you folks. Uh, okay, each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement timed by these folks. You'll have one minute cards and then we come out with a gong and then a squirt gun, I think, if you go over. I will then ask the candidates a series of questions. Each candidate will have up to three minutes to answer a question. The moderator will choose the order in which the candidates will ask will answer each question. I'll probably go in you know, straight order if I can. And then at the end, each candidate will have three minutes to make a closing statement. And following the meeting is the good stuff. Uh, candidates will have individual tables where they can meet and answer questions from Solara residents, hand out campaign literature, and uh, drink some of the wine and eat some of the cheese. So, welcome. Okay, let's get the party started with opening statements. And let's see, we'll start off at the end there with Rosalicia. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, thank you, Solera, for hosting this event. I'm grateful to be here with my counterparts and to have you here present. As you have heard earlier, we've been here. I've made the Inland Empire my home since um, I for college, since 1990. We have raised our family here. We have three children. We live in Yucaipa. And we have, as a realtor for 16 and a half years, I have seen the quality of life for many diminish in, in, in our district and in California. And unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with the, house of cost, uh, the, the cost of housing um, in our area. That, along with the high taxes that we have coming through our state, um, has made it very difficult for many people to achieve that American dream. I'm a daughter of immigrant parents. My grandfather came to the States in the 60s under the Bracero program. I live the American dream. I'm grateful for this country. I'm grateful for everything that it offers, and I want to continue that possibility and that dream for many Californians who are missing out on that opportunity right now with the current legislation that we have. So in the hopes of that, I'm hoping that to go to Sacramento and help, um, help bring some thought into the philosophy that allows that, sorry, yes, I, I just thought that. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to bring some balance back. Our government was designed by our founding fathers to have some sort of checks and balances, and right now, we don't have that. As a supermajority, uh, one party rule, I don't think it's healthy to a democracy that is representative of its people and its residents. So I'm hoping to bring some sort of balance into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people here, and I want to applaud you for taking the step to inform yourself about these elections. You are what really makes the difference in everything that we do, and you're why I'm running. So I am, I've been a small business owner and a journalist for my entire career, and decided to get involved with politics because I too felt that things could be done better in the Inland Empire. I think that we live in a beautiful place I've lived here for 18 years and I've chosen longer than I've lived anywhere in my life and have chosen to make this my home. 
but we face um, income inequality, an explosion of warehousing jobs that are gonna be automated out of existence. We have the worst air quality in the nation, and our educational system is definitely failing our kids. We need to invest in these things, in, and we need to have representation up in Sacramento who will bring that money back home to us. So we've had Republican administrations, we've had Democratic administrations, but we've had a Republican representative in this seat forever. And as a result, we have not brought back the programs and the money to our area. We are spending more in taxes and giving more to the government than we are returning home in projects for us. So that's why I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This is a great opportunity to try to reach out to all those that are part of the district. I'm Abigail Medina. I am actually the school board president for San Bernardino Unified School District. And you'll see, and, and uh, throughout my whole campaign, education is definitely one of my biggest platforms. It is a true, uh, it is a true pathway out of poverty. And just so you know a little bit about myself, and not in, in case I don't get a um, chance to explain it later, I went through 14 different schools. I was in foster care. And um, through all of this, um, education was something that we should all strive for. And unfortunately, that wasn't an opportunity that I faced. And so after having my five children, four that are currently at Cal State, um, in different Cal State systems, um, and two that are married, I was able to find that education, when you look at San Bernardino, it was one of the performance state, um, districts. We were in the 60s, as was mentioned. But now, as of yesterday, we found out that we're now up to 95% uh, graduation rate. And this just shows the experience that I have as a school board president. When you look at the economic uh, prosperity that we're trying to push for, the e economic development, when you look at the healthcare portion that we're expanding within our school district, we're the ninth largest school district in the state of California. We manage over half a billion dollars in funding. And, and we have, we're the, actually the biggest employer in the district. So that's one of the areas um, that I will definitely be pushing for. I also want to mention regarding uh, the the career pathways, when you look at uh, what we're doing and what we need to um, help expand, like I mentioned earlier, the, the, the economic development. Yesterday we had the California Secretary of Labor come down, Julie Su, and we were looking at what can we actually do to make sure that our communities are being prosperous. And like I mentioned earlier, looking at the career pathways and so forth is definitely one of those avenues. Hey everyone, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am uh, current, I'm Christina Poracci. I am currently the president for Redlands Unified School District uh, while concurrently presiding as an association um, of Colton Educator President. I am part of the State Council for California Teacher Association and I am part of the Republican Caucus there. I've been a negotiator for um, the uh, Colton Unified School District for 11 years. So I want to take my experience as a uniter, as a negotiator, and peacemaker to uh, Sacramento. I will be working hard to bring the uh, change by bridging the disparity that is going on between the Republican <coughs> and Democrats at this time. <laughs> Most of the, my experience has been working with um, Democrats we have different views than um, Republicans, and um, a lot of the times I um, I got them to understand that we have different views, but ultimately we work for the people. Um, with my work as a union leader and as a board leader, um, I want to take to, to Sacramento um, a balance. Um, we don't have a balance at this point, every new, tax is passing every new, we, we have our kids leaving our states. My son, which is married, he is thinking about leaving the state because he can't afford to live here. So we need people with experience fighting on the front lines of negotiations. And this is why I volunteered to go um, battle for our values and our state. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. So five years ago, almost to the day, I was sitting up here in the same location. Instead of five, there were six of us. Um, no one had any idea who I was. I was running because people told me to stop complaining and get out and do something. And I think most of you know that we did get out and do something. Um, I, I agree a lot with what um, Chris Goodfellow said. Our education system is failing us. And 
and I will also go a little one step further and say that the Republican Party is failing Republicans and they're failing the state of California. As everyone has said up here, we need more of a balance in Sacramento, but we got to be realistic. We got to be pragmatic. I mean, if you if you compare the decline of the schools in California, it almost runs directly in um, the decline or the the rise of the power of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is the party that has made it difficult for schools to rebound and come back. I'm a pragmatist. Schools are not going to be fixed by a Republican because it has to come from the CTA, it has to come from the, the Democrats. But what we can do, and what hasn't been done, and I agree also with uh, Ms. Goodfellow that um, our district has not been well represented by, a by a Republican state senators. We need someone who's going to come into the district, pick up the phone, call every council member, every county supervisor, the building department heads, the heads of the different unions, and bring everyone together and create a coalition that then the senator can go up to Sacramento and say, hey look, I've got all these council members, I've got all these cities, I've got the police departments, I've got all the groups here asking for some change and for some direction um, in the right direction in, in the Inland Empire. I'm the only one with any elected uh, local government experience and I think that that is important. I will not go up there, I will not be learning on the job, I've learned on the job, I've been under fire, and I think that I'm the best candidate to move forward up in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is an easy one. If you become a state senator, what will be your top priority and why? And let's start with Chris. So my top priority is going to be dealing with our environment. And to put, the first thing that I would want to do is to be the last state in the country to put an extraction tax on oil. So we are facing cataclysmic global warming and climate change. We are, again, as I mentioned, we had 102 poor air quality days in San Bernardino. They had four in LA. We can transform our economy and use this as a real opportunity for us to take the money that the oil companies are paying in every other state in the country and use it to build infrastructure, to do green energy development projects, to transform our economy to solar so that our kids have clean air to breathe. These are also tremendous jobs that we could be developing going forward. The warehouses that we have and the, and the infrastructure and our location and its proximity to the ports is not gonna change, it's not going anywhere. But we could be building Tesla zero emission semis here. We could be having those kinds of jobs in this area that are innovative and new. The other thing that I would say is that the green energy economy is not done when we have solar on the rooftops. We're gonna need other kinds of technologies because those batteries and those fuels that we need are polluting as well. And so we're going to continue to need to innovate on that. And I think that we should put, use the problems that we face to focus Sacramento's attention on this community. I think it will bring economic development to the area and it will also improve the quality of life for all of our residents. Thank you, Chris. Abigail? So uh, I kind of spoke on it a little bit uh, earlier with regarding education. It is a true pathway out of poverty, and I will not apologize for using that as a way. Now, it was mentioned that we are um, underperforming, and, and in reality, San Bernardino City by School District, we were actually the lowest performing schools within the, uh, within the state, and my children were attending one of the lowest performing schools within the lowest performing school district. So just imagine, um, what the struggles were for families. And, and there's many, many families that just can't move um, um, from one neighborhood to another city uh, because they can't afford it. So what, what are we doing realistically? And I think this is where my experience come into play. When you look at transparency, when you look at the budget, when you look at the, how we're holding those that are, are, are um, educating and those that are working with our children, that's why I also involve parent engagement, an accountability process as well. We have to better train and equip our education system. And because of that, we it took, it took several years. I've been on the school board for about six years now. It took several years. But when I talk about what, what actions uh, speaks louder than words in regards to 66% to be now at 95.1% graduation rate, and also making sure that more of our kids are reaching higher education career pathways, these students are gonna be your doctors 
these students are eventually gonna be your neighbors and what are we gonna do to help bring that prosperity level and so that they're able to get in good, good paying jobs. Um, going to college, like I mentioned, having these great trades opportunities. Uh, in our schools, we actually have, um, in, uh, we have 3D printing manufacturing. We also have uh, computer software. So with, that way, every student, uh, by the time they graduate, they will have a good paying job at the end. And so that's what I'm here to give. And, and it was talked about, we need to have that change in regards to education, and I'm definitely the one to do it. <coughs> Um, I know you talk about education, yeah. but that's my passion too. So, um, um, so I've been a teacher for 15 years. I've uh, been teaching kindergarten and first grade, and uh, right now I'm out of the classroom because um, I'm the president of the union. But what it's the focus has been away from education. Um, education has been very politicized. Um, instead of teaching the students how to arithmetics and language arts, we are focusing a lot um, sex ed. If you all know AB 328, it's instead of focusing on um, instead of focusing on how we teach our students, a lot of the politicians that have nothing to do with education, they don't understand education, they don't understand the kids, they never been in the classroom, they never tied 20 shoelaces in 10 minutes, <laughs> or, or white noses, and, um, but they're coming and telling us that we're gonna have to teach a fifth grade student, excuse my language, how to put a condom on a dildo. So that's what, that's what my passion is, that's why, because at this point, we need to focus on teaching the whole child. We need to focus on teaching them how to be better citizens at some point, not how to have sex. So um, education is gonna be my big deal. With, with Mike Morel, we've been working on signing um, legislature that to make, to, to have transparency of what curriculum our students are learning. So go to your schools and find out what uh, you, grandchild or your child is being taught in um, sex ed classes. So that's where I'm coming from. Besides teaching a child, besides teaching them uh, life skills, I, I do not agree with AB 328 and I'm very angry with that um, bill. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with uh, three school board members up here, I got to at least touch on education again. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I do agree our educational system is, is in dire straits and it's something that needs to, um, to be fixed. And I'd love to see these um, school board members up here to take on a role in, in a leadership role because not only do we have the issues with the curriculum, but we also have the issues with the school bullying. And for once, I'd like to see a school, a school board stand up and say, we're gonna really have a zero tolerance here. But I don't wanna to waste too much time on that because that's not my number one. As I told you, Republicans not gonna get that done. You gotta count on the Democrats and the CPA to get any, any fix there. I have three priorities, taxes, taxes, and taxes. I think taxes are, are the biggest problem that we face. Our tax system is designed right now so that when we hit the next recession, which I believe has started, when we hit the next recession, we are so de dependent on income tax and on the high level earners in the income tax. Unless we find a way to restructure our overall tax system, we are not gonna be able to pay for all the services that Sacramento keeps giving us. And we are going to hit, I mean, the governor likes to talk about the huge reserve and the, the rainy day fund that he has. It'll be gone quickly once all of these high earners start moving their property out of the state. And they're already doing that. They want to stay, still live here, and they still want to do business here, but they're moving their personal income out of the state because they know the taxes, the income tax here is, is it, it doesn't, uh, it, there's no reason to stay in California. So I think we need to start addressing taxes. The SB1 tax, the tax that hits people who drive the furthest, and people in Beaumont have to drive a long ways. That's why they buy homes out here. We have affordable homes, because you can you drive an hour and a half or an hour, um, you spend two hours away from your family every day, but you can afford to buy a home out here. We need to bring manufacturing jobs, we need to bring jobs out to where the homes are. We shouldn't be passing laws that says, those of us who are paying the highest gas taxes to drive to work and to come back from work should also um, 
to have all that tax money go to the cities. Our governor and our legislators decided that the SB1 money should be used for low-income housing. Low-income housing is not going to be built in places like Beaumont because we don't have the transportation hubs that, that the governor says that we need to have. And so that means that those of us who are paying the most taxes because we're driving the furthest are going to have to pay to put in a stack and pack in Redlands and to put in other apartment buildings in San Diego, Los Angeles, Sacramento. So it's a transfer of wealth from those of us who are in the rural areas who have to drive the furthest and um, that is something that taxes is going to kill us if we don't find a way to, to redo it. I honestly believe that both parties are gonna see this in the next year or two. And when that happens and when the recession comes around and the taxes fail, you need someone in our seat up there that understands finance and understands taxes. And that's why I'm running. Thank you. There's a next question. The, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Certainly not least. Thank you. So, um, like my counterparts, I actually have the same uh, background. I think we all share, most of us share um, real estate, or I'm sorry, school board uh, background. And I know Chris is very in tune with the real estate aspect as well. Um, from a realtor's perspective, I'm going to come in and address the real estate issue in California. I completely agree with um, pretty much what you've said, especially with in regards to the taxes. But overall, the umbrella, I think, um, is going to be, for me, housing um, and the lack of inventory in California. In 2014-15, was estimated that we were about 1 million units short in California. The latest and most recent one is about 1.8 million. Talking about the principles of economics, we understand that we don't when we don't have enough of a supply and there's a large demand, the prices are affected and I skyrocket. So having said that, um, one of the things that I have personally uh, experienced as a school board member are families who are homeless, who call our school district and say, do you happen to know of a place that we can rent? We're willing to just, we just need a room. It's just my son and I. Um, that breaks my heart. The lack of housing in California is affecting the affordability in California, along with taxes. Um, but when people don't have the basic need as shelter, then it cascades into other issues, such as families who are affected because the children don't have a safe and secure place to do their homework or to thrive. Um, and when we children are not thriving, they're not doing well in school. When they're not doing well in school, they're not graduating or they're not succeeding um, in school. They're not, it affects them in many ways. When that happens, they start making unwise choices. So then they start becoming, some of them become arrested. And they enter into a world where they're, they're affecting our public safety, um, and they enter the system. Um, along with that, um, the lack of housing also caters into our, uh, in portion, to our homeless situation. And so, to me, housing is pretty much an umbrella that covers many, many issues of cascades. So if we attack the housing inventory in California, I think there will be a lot of other issues that we'll be able to take care of um, because of that. So um, I, for me, it would be housing, and of course, taxes and education, all of that is part, but a basic need that brings dignity to a human being, whether you're young or a senior, is imperative. Thank you. Okay, now for the next question. All right. yes. <laughs> the so-called Proposition 13 split roll ballot initiative has qualified for November's ballot. Currently, all properties are covered by the tax relief provisions of Proposition 13. A yes vote would mean that commercial and industrial properties would be reassessed and taxed each year based on their market value. And contrary to what you might have heard, this initiative would not affect residential properties. Do you support this initiative? Why or why not? And we'll start with Abigail. So first of all, I want to start off with, um, during my 2016 election, um, one of the concerns people were talking about is uh, Proposition 13. And, and I was not in support of dismantling unless with what we currently have now is making it split. And I wanna educate those folks here that um, I would go to the houses and they'll say, Abigail, don't, as long as you don't touch the Proposition 13. 
But what the difference is now is that we're actually gonna be removing any homeowners. So all of your homeowners, right? So you would be excluded from the split role. All it would be dealing is directly with corporations and businesses. And you have to realize, back in the 1970s, they were they were paying uh, they weren't well they were paying the same uh, interest rate or not interest rate the taxes from what it is now. So all it is is that they're going to pay what everybody else is paying. And and this is like I said earlier, this is not where it's going to impact homeowners. This is just where the corporations will be paying their fair share. That's all it is. And so with that split rule, otherwise if it didn't have that, I would have not supported. But since it is separating both, I do support it. Christina. Um, first, I want to make it clear that if we are on the ballot on 2020, two of us, uh, November, by then the decision will be made. So regardless of where we go, it's not going to really affect what we do at that point. And if a uh, Republican wins, uh, we have 18 to 29. I don't think we can overturn that. But I do want to make it clear, I am against it. Uh, we just talked about, um, and I know I am a teacher, I'm a union uh, talk, so it's like you should be for that because I know CTA is supporting it. I cannot support it because so many propositions have been given this fancy title that has to do with school, with kids, with safe, uh, safe uh, neighborhoods, like uh, Prop 47 has safe neighborhoods and it's talking about uh, nonviolent crimes, right? And um, we will lose more businesses. I wanna bring businesses back. I want the taxes that the businesses generate. I want the jobs for California. I want California to be back where California was when I came here in 92. Amen. I don't want my son to leave. I don't want to have to leave California when I retire because I cannot afford to live in this, in this place. I hate the cold. I grew up in a cold weather. I am cold now. I hate this weather. I want back the July weather. So um, I don't want to lose more businesses. So um, I am against it. Thank you. Yeah. Boy. Yeah, this is the easy one. Um, split roll is a disaster. And people talk about, as, as uh, Ms. Medina brought up, that if you're a homeowner, it's not going to impact you. There are so many homeowners nowadays that don't even know what Prop 13 is. And it's because they didn't own homes back then. Um, I missed the, that election by two years. I was two years too young to vote for Prop 13 but it has had a dramatic impact on home ownership. A lot of homeowners now say, well, my taxes don't go up that much. They don't go up that much because of Prop 13. Right. Now, if you think that the legislators in California are gonna stop after doing corporations and, and commercial and not come after your homes, you're wrong. That's right. But to think that this is only a homeowner issue, it is not. Because what's gonna happen is there are companies, big companies, have owned property for 20, 30 years those properties are all going to be reassessed. They're gonna owe tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. Those companies are not gonna pay hundreds of million dollars. They're gonna pay $10 million a year to hire a legal team to fight it. They're gonna drag this out. So who's fighting that? The counties are gonna to have to hire lawyers. The counties are gonna to have to hire additional assessors. You and I are gonna be paying for that. But also think about it this way. Do you think that any of these companies are gonna pay the additional taxes and then not pass it on to all of us, not just homeowners, but everybody. And again, this is another regressive tax that comes back to people who are at the lower income levels. Now, I'll give you a good example of how this is gonna crush some businesses and, and close some businesses. I, let's say I'm a restaurant owner and I own a, I, I'm leasing a location from a property owner who now gets hit with split roll tax. Split roll tax is gonna mean that that property owner is not Google, not Facebook. They don't have the attorneys to raise it. They're gonna pay it, they're gonna raise the taxes on my restaurant. Restaurants make one to two percent profit margin. I know I've managed restaurants for five years, profit margin is very tight. The argument, the other side will say, well, you know, you can just move your restaurant. If you've been in the restaurant business, you don't build a clientele and then pick up and move it um, one mile, five miles, you don't even move it around the corner because you're gonna lose your clientele. Those companies, those small businesses are gonna say, look it, I can't afford to continue paying that lease. I can't afford to um, move my restaurant. If I raise my prices, I'm gonna lose that business. 
Split roll is a disaster. I'm glad it's on the ballot. I'll tell you why I'm glad it's on the ballot, because I think it's an issue that Republicans can get strongly behind. I think it's an issue that Republicans get some free advertising. If we promote issues like the split roll, there also is another issue that's coming up that's going to fix or try to tweak the, uh, the criminal justice realignment system. There's also one that's going to ask for uh, make the death penalty illegal. You make the death penalty illegal, you put that on the ballot, and you're going to get every Republican in this district to come out. So I'm all in favor of putting the uh, get rid of the death penalty on the, on the ballot. I'm all in favor of getting split roll on the ballot, but people have to understand that split roll is going to impact everybody, and you have no idea how bad it's going to be. Well said. Um, I'm also, I'm not in support of um, Prop 13. Um, I come from a family who owns small businesses, including restaurants. My dad was an owner of small restaurants, and um, in speaking, um, as I'm a former chair um, of the Yucaipa Chamber of Commerce, so I'm very privy to the small businesses in our communities that make those communities thrive. One of the things that, it, that um, along with what uh, Lloyd said is, um, we think we are taxing the top people. It always trickles down to the little people, to the business owners and to the community members, to the family members who are trying to um, care and provide for their families. And what that, does, what that will do will be to increase lease amounts for many small people. And the businesses that I've spoken to in regards to, um, to split roll is that, hey, listen, you think you're affecting those people that own the buildings? He goes, no, you're affecting us because it's gonna come down to us. Um, I had a gentleman who um, owns a brewery who spoke about, listen, I have to work here um, double time because I can't afford the, the idea of uh, starting a small business. When you're starting off, you don't have a lot of leeway and a lot of income to make your, um, your, your, um, your payroll. So he was working double time to make sure that he had enough money to pay his employees. With split roll, with the idea of split roll, he said, he goes, that will, that will hurt our business even further. So it has ramification effects. Once again, it sounds good superficially, but when we look into the effects into the families and how it affects the everyday um, person trying to start their own business and provide for their families, that's who it affects, and I'm not okay with that. Thank you. I am in support of it, and I am a small business owner. I, so I am a small business owner. Small businesses are exempt in the, in the proposition at this point. So small business will not be affected by this, nor will homeowners. What's happening right now is that large corporations are buying smaller corporations or even larger corporations who have historically low taxes and they're being able to transfer their entire tax base to a lower tax rate from back to the 70s. So we can't allow uh, large corporations to dodge the tax system and use our property tax system to avoid paying their fair share. California school kids used to, we used to be in the top 10 in per pupil spending. So all of these folks up here have talked about education. California used to be in the top 10 in per pupil educational spending until Prop 13 came along. Now we're 41. So if we wanna look at how do we improve outcomes for kids, not just graduation rates, but actually prepare kids to be able to meet the job demands of the future, we have to train them. We have to raise their educational level. We have to, they have to have more knowledge to go into the workforce. It's, that is where we're gonna see people lifted out of poverty. That's where we're going to increase the, our own tax base because they're going to be making more money and they're not going to be reliant upon us. We are letting our kids down. Every day when we allow them to graduate without the ability to have A through G requirements completed or an apprenticeship program that they're going into or a career path that's viable, we are all ending up taking care of them. And studies show that time and time again, that we, when we invest in kids and we invest in their education, the long-term output of that is raising more taxes for the state because they now are able to go off and be entrepreneurs. The other thing that I want to say as an entrepreneur, 
is that large companies are getting away with lower tax rates and small companies come in, because those large companies have been around for a lot longer, and the small company has to pay higher taxes than the large company. So we're gonna level that. We're gonna make it possible for other entrepreneurs to enter into the system and pay the same as everybody else would be paying. So to me, it's actually a benefit for small business. It's not gonna hold small business back. It's gonna make it possible for us to compete against major corporations that are really the ones who are holding a lot of innovation in, their, in a very small number of hands. Thank you. Oh. Okay, on to the next question. I guess I'm okay with this. Right. Despite more than 50 anti-bullying laws and regulation, bullying remains a serious problem in our schools, resulting in significant detrimental impact on students' physical and mental health and academic performance. Why do you think schools have been unable to enforce a zero tolerance policy on bullying putting our children and grandchildren at risk. And we'll start with Christina. Um, we keep on adding, I mean, when I say we, I mean Sacramento, it keeps on adding new laws. If you um, noticed recently, um, a new law was passed, uh, willful defiance, and um, it was tried to, um, be implemented for TK to third grade. Um, the teachers were split on that. So what did the Sacramento do? They went and increased it on the way to eighth grade. So when a child willful, is willfully defiant and disrespectful in the classroom, and it turns to the teacher and casts the teacher out, and the teacher can do anything about it, um, the many laws that are added by legislature, by people that don't know anything about kids, that's what is causing bullying to be more and more um, prevalent. Amen to that, that's right. a school board member, I'm not an educator. I grew up in a family um, where my mom was a teacher and I spent uh, six years before I got on council attending every school board meeting um, in Beaumont because my kids had, had started kindergarten and I didn't want crazy curriculum coming through without my knowing about it. Um, I can tell you that what the problem is in the school districts is they the administrators hands are tied similar to what Christine is saying. Um, and basically, I believe 3% of their, 97% of their funds are restricted. Um, and I can